Acts. If you want to grab your Bibles this morning, we are going to jump into the message this morning. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read the first 15 verses of Acts chapter 17. I want to say good morning to those watching online. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Hope you guys will get a lot out of the word this morning. For those of you here, um, this is a message that um, I was actually hanging out with my son this week. I'll tell you more in a minute, but watching Thomas the Train and got inspired for this message. <laughs> you just never know what, what it takes. So Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 1, it's, uh, Paul is uh, the guy they're talking about when they, in verse 1 it says, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Ampollinonia, that's a big word, but we're going to think it's Ampollinonia, okay, they came to Thessalonica, where, they were, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he received with them from scriptures, explaining and, prov- er, sorry, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a, f- and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to a crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. They, then they made Jason and the other post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were more of more noble character than the Thessalonians. This is one of those days. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas, or Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left him with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as as possible. Let's pray this morning and then I'll describe what we're talking about this morning. God, I thank you for your word. I pray that as I speak it this morning that you would help it to make sense, that it would land on hearts that are tender and hearts that are seeking you this morning, that if anyone is at a place in their life where they feel like they are being um, rerouted or, or detoured or whatever's going on in their life, that this word would encourage their hearts and draw them back to you. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I want to talk to you on the subject of derailed. Have you ever been derailed? So this week, I was with Weston, and we were watching Thomas the Train. Yes, so good. I have to say, on a side note, I think Thomas the Train is better than Barney. I am so sick of Barney. Uh, Come on, preach, yeah. Yeah. I'm so sick of Barney. So now we've moved on to Thomas the Train because he turns two next week. And we're watching Thomas the Train. And there's one episode because there's only so many, too. I, whoever produces these kid shows, could you please make more? Because, you know, you just go on YouTube and you watch them on there. And there's only, like, so many that actually aren't video games that actual you can watch the train. And so we're watching this one that we've watched over and over. And there's a scene where Thomas is, is kind of being disobedient to the, the uh, fat controller, which that poor man. How do you get that name? The fat controller. I don't know where that came from, but the, the fat controller tells him to do something, and he does the other thing, and so Thomas goes off in the wrong direction and ends up in a whole lot of trouble and ends up actually, because the island of, what's it called? That, that, what is it? Sodor. Sodor. The island of Sodor is an island, and he gets to the end of the island where it ends, and he falls over almost into the water. It's very intense, okay? <laughs> and then this really hot train comes and pulls him back. I don't know. She's hot. What's her name? Emily? Wow. (laughs) 
I thought it was a bigger name, but I don't know, Jim, if that's what you think it is. You are educated on Thomas the Train. Four kids, four kids. I, it might be Emily. And she pulls him back, and him, he was almost, almost derailed to the point that he would have drowned in the ocean and we wouldn't have Thomas left. Was he horrible? I know. And as I was watching that, I came up with this message. And I thought, I wonder in our lives how many of us get derailed when we're so close to doing what God has called us to do. Or we've gotten so close to the place that we know we're destined to be. Or we're just about ready to step out in a great big area of our life and something comes along and derails us off course and we feel like we cannot go any further. Anybody feel that way? Yeah, okay, good, got the right message this morning. Maybe there's situations in your life where someone has walked out on you recently and you're like, I don't know what happened. We were going so well and our our marriage was working out so great and now they're just gone. Maybe you've been at a place where you've worked so hard in your career and everything's gone so great and you find yourself without a job this morning. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know for all of us, we go through times where we feel derailed and off course. And if we don't fix it, we're going to end up in the wrong place. Because the way that God has designed your life, each one of you have a divine destiny and purpose over your life. And the way he designed your life is he sees you now and he sees you in the future. And if you don't learn to listen to his voice and to listen to the Holy Spirit to guide you to where you need to go, you'll end up in 20 years way over here when God's plan for you was to be over here. And that doesn't mean that God can't reroute your course, right? It doesn't mean that God can't give you grace and use you over here. But I don't know about you. I want to be right where I'm supposed to be. And sometimes what happens is life comes and derails us off the place that we're supposed to be. The word derail, actually, and it's talking about trains on tracks. It says to leave the tracks accidentally. A train was derailed after it collided with a herd of cattle. That's always unfortunate. Or it accidentally leaves the tracks. The trolley cars had a tendency to derail on sharp corners. Does that feel like anybody's life sometimes? All of a sudden you come and you hit a roadblock and you're like, and then you're off, right? You derail because of sharp corners. We read in Acts 17 this morning a long story about Paul, and you're probably trying to figure out where does trains and all this fit in. I don't really know if it's about the trains. But what I love about the story of Paul is that Paul was constantly in a place where he had to switch directions. Paul was constantly in a place where because of the purpose he was after, which was literally to reach planet Earth with the gospel of Christ, Paul constantly was being rerouted. The first story we read in Acts 17 is Paul is there, he's in Thessalonica, he's preaching the gospel, and what happens? Haters gonna hate, right? They come out, they start trying to get oppose him, they start trying to take him down, they start trying to tell him it's not going to work, you can't preach the gospel, we don't know who you're talking about, this Jesus is not our king. And so Paul gets derailed off course and sent on to Berea. But you know what I love about Paul in Acts 17? In this place right here, he's sent off course, but the people in Thessalonica still heard the gospel, and it says many still responded. So sometimes in your life, even though you've been derailed, it does not denote the place you've been. It does not mean that where you were didn't have an effect or didn't do anything. It just means that now you got to get back on course. And so they send Paul to Berea, and Silas and Timothy go with him, and they get to Berea, and what do they do? These guys are, these guys are fearless. The Apostle Paul was fearless. This guy didn't care what anyone said. They didn't care what anybody thought. He didn't care. He, I mean, he got, this guy got stoned. He got shipwrecked. He got thrown in prison. It didn't matter what happened. He was so passionately pursuing God and passionate about giving the gospel to all of humanity that he didn't care what came against him. He refused to give up. And so he's sent away for preaching the gospel, goes to the next city, and starts preaching all over again. Why? Because Paul didn't care when he got derailed. He just got right back on track and went right back to the next place. Every time he got stoned, every time he went to prison, every time that that, that he, I mean, he was in in Philippians chapter four, he writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he writes that, that, that it's his joy to suffer for Christ. And he writes all this from four feet of sewage. The guy is standing in four feet of sewage saying, I've learned to be content and I've learned to rejoice. Four feet of sewage. 
Anybody excited in four feet of sewage? Yeah. Not me. Four feet of sewage, and he's learning to be content. Why? Because Paul refused. He didn't mean he didn't get derailed, but he refused to stop every time he was derailed. And so he goes into Berea, and he gets to Berea, and he begins to preach again, and immediately they come after him, and then they send him on to the next city, but they kept Silas and Timothy there to continue doing what Paul had done because Paul refused to quit. He refused to say, I will stop doing what I know God has called me to do. What is our greatest purpose as believers of Christ? Spread the word. Thanks, Chris. Our greatest purpose as believers of, and followers of Jesus Christ, as we've talked about this a lot this year, is the Great Commission, to go into all the world, to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth before the second coming of Christ. No big deal. If you remember, I told you before, if you feel like your resume isn't very qualified, you don't have a good education, you dropped out of high school, you don't have a good job, you're sitting next to your doctor friends and they're all like talking about their da 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 and you're like, I got a big job too. What's your job? I got to evangelize the entire planet before Jesus comes. That's seven billion people. Good luck with your surgery. I'm just kidding. If you're a doctor, we need you. (laughs) Amen? Yes, we need you, dear. We need, we need you nurses and you doctors. But, 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 but a lot of us feel demeaned in our calling, right? I, I, I'm only this. No, your purpose on the earth is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what happens is we get derailed. So you're writing notes this morning. A couple things to write down. First one is that derailing tries to distract us from our greatest purpose. Derailing tries to distract us from our greatest purpose. Yesterday morning, Kelsey and I woke up in downtown Indy. We'd stayed in a hotel because we were at a wedding for a college friend on Friday night. And we went to breakfast with a bunch of friends. And then we were heading back home to pick up Weston's Thomas the Train cake. There's a theme here because he loves Thomas the Train. And we were going to celebrate his birthday with my family who's here this weekend. And so we were coming back from Indy and we were, we were downtown. And I don't know where we were because I'm not real familiar with downtown Indy. But we were downtown and I always just come back. I think it's Meridian, the road that just goes straight to 69 and just brings you straight on up, you know, because that's just what I do. But my wonderful wife wanted to get on a highway because, you know, she likes highways and she likes to get home quicker. And so we said, okay, we'll get on the highway. And so we got the GPS on and, and I, I hit home and we started going And we got somewhere over on the west side of Indy. I don't know where we were. And I looked at my GPS and and like, okay, I'm from Michigan, so there's my hand. See, but I know it's Indiana. How do you do this? How do y'all do this? Look, I'm learning Indiana. I said, y'all, how do you do this? There's not a thing here? John, I know, you're from Michigan. We'll keep doing this? Okay, so anyway, say if Indy's here, you guys got to learn. I'm going to teach you right now, okay? This is Michigan. See, there's Lake Michigan over here. That's the prettiest place in the world. You should go. Up here's Lake Superior and Ontario's over. I don't know, Canada stole one of them. But then over here's Lake Huron and then Lake Erie. That's Michigan. Okay, now this is Indiana. <laughs> okay, so I don't, these aren't mountains, really. I just have too much fat. Right here is Indianapolis, all right? <laughs> Indianapolis, stick with me. And Marion, somewhere up this, okay, Indiana, up here, right? Okay, so, so we're over here. And our GPS showed home is over here. I don't know. I don't know what happened. So all I know is it shows homes over here, and it's sending us over here, and we need to get here. And what happens in those moments is when we get derailed, it distracts us from our greatest purpose, right? Our purpose in that moment was to get Weston's cake. And the last thing I was thinking about was Weston's cake. I might have needed a little marriage counseling. You know what I mean? My poor wife, I'm high maintenance, she puts up with a lot. And I'm, I'm holding that steering wheel, like, you know, like, because I'm a nice guy. And I'm nice, right? Right? Yes. And so I didn't say anything, did I? No, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I really didn't. I didn't get mad at her because I knew it was my fault because my GPS. But anyways, in that moment, I wasn't thinking about where I was trying to get. I was thinking about how upset I was about the fact that I was off course. 
And see, what happens in our lives sometimes is we get off course, whatever it is, if it's something, a relationship that's broken, or maybe you're at a place where you're questioning your faith and you feel like, I don't even know God, I'm not even seeking God in my life, and I'm so off course that all I do is I stand over here trying to figure out why am I off course? If Paul had done that, the book of Acts would not have been written because he would have sat in a jail cell and rotted. He'd have been like, I don't know why I got put in jail. So horrible, I'm stuck here. I'm just trying to preach the gospel and now I'm stuck in jail and I don't know why. I wonder what happened in my childhood to put me in jail. I want, you know, that big light came from the sky. Maybe that wasn't God. Maybe that was the devil. I don't know. Came down, it was like, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Maybe I was, maybe, I don't know. I'm here, I guess my life's over. And we get distracted from our greatest purpose because the problem is we focus so much on the issue and not the end result that we're stuck where we are and will never fulfill our greatest calling, which is reaching the world with the gospel of Christ, trying to figure out why we've been derailed. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for our light and momentary troubles, they only last for a moment, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. This is a man who had, like I said, been in four feet of sewage, been beaten, shipwrecked, This guy had been abused. This guy had been called names that many of us wouldn't want to hear. And yet he says, our light in momentary troubles, this is just for a moment. They don't even compare to the eternal glory that is in Christ when we finally get to heaven. So why do we let the things that come against us get us off course? The second thing you can write down this morning is that derailing tries to convince us that we are the ones with the power. This is a big one, because what happens in our life is we get off course, right? And the things happen, and we're like, what did I do wrong? And where did I go go wrong in this, this, this relationship? Or where did I go wrong in this job? Or where did I go wrong in this place? And what did, I, what did me and me, 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 all about me, right? And God's like, look, it's not about you. This has nothing to do with you. This has everything to do with me and the plan that I have for your life. You're not the one with the power to control your life. He is. And if some of us would learn that this morning, our lives would look completely different. If you would learn that the things that you do do not, they do, they do, they do, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Help me out, somebody. What do they do? They align. They, 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 you know, you can, like, you have some control. You know what I mean? Like, God gives you choice. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. God gives you choice. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you're not the one with the power. He is. So you get off course and you're stuck over here and you're like, okay, if I do this better, if I work better, if I get there better, then I'll finally be able to fix it. You can't fix it. What you can do is you can fix your eyes on Christ. That's what Paul said to do. He says, I fix my eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of my faith. If you're at a place this morning where you've been derailed and you're off course, stop trying to fix yourself and start fixing your eyes on Christ and let him work out the situation for you. Derailing tries to convince you that you have the power. Another one to write down is that derailing tries to take your focus off of the finish line. So many times in Paul's journey, he could have taken his eyes off his calling. This man went through so much. I love reading through the book of Acts, and I encourage you to do that. Because there's so much to the book of Acts where Paul should have stopped. But it keeps going and keeps going and keeps going because he refused to quit. Sometimes someone had to come, right? Sometimes the hot little train had to come up behind and pull him off the ledge. Emily, we call her. Sometimes she come, he had, she had to help him off, right? Sometimes they had to reroute him and send him to Berea. Sometimes that happened. It wasn't even his own doing. But no matter what happened, he kept his eyes focused on what was ahead. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 14, Paul writes and he says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Do you ever consider all the success you've had in life is considered loss for the sake of Christ? 
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. This guy knew what he was talking about. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul is writing this passage at a point in his life where he should have quit, where he'd been so derailed off course that he's standing in that four foot of sewage that he's sitting there and he says I count everything I've gained as loss we'd look at him and think dude you're an idiot you're standing in sewage and you think you've gained something but see Paul had the right perspective he knew what he had gained had nothing to do with things of this world, had nothing to do with the education he had, it had nothing to do with the accolades, and it had everything to do with sharing the gospel and knowing God. And yet, he counted all of that as a loss for the sake of knowing Christ. You see, sometimes when we get off course, we lose focus of that call of sharing the gospel with the world and knowing God. Sometimes when we're off course, we're so focused on how we can work it out and how we can change it and how we can fix it and how we can get the best education money can buy and the, the right medication and whatever it is for you. And I don't think that stuff is wrong, but the problem is, again, we start focusing on all those things and not focusing on the finish line and we get off course. The last one to write down this morning, I wanna finish here this morning is that derailing is the enemy's plan to make you quit. Did you know that the enemy, Satan, wants you to quit? First Peter chapter 5, it says, Be sober, spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers who are all over the world. He says, resist the devil. In James, James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You say, but I don't know how to resist the devil. How do I resist him? I don't understand. All of us constantly hear voices, right? Not like, don't, don't give me, no, okay. I know some of y'all are thinking, I bet you hear voices. No, but all of us, I don't mean like literal voices, maybe for you it is. But all of us have, every time we're about to step into a place where we are serving God at a greater level, or we're doing something great, or we're trying to restore a building, or we're trying to launch more churches in Africa, or launch more Center for Successes, I don't know what your vein is, I'm talking about me, okay? Every time we're about to step in to one step closer to the destiny that God has for us in the way that will reach more people to build the kingdom of God, we will hear, you can't do it. You may not hear that voice, but you'll feel it, right? You can't accomplish that. Who do you think you are? And so Peter writes and he says, be on alert because your adversary, the devil, is seeking who he can devour. It says he's prowling along. He's coming after you. He's like a snake. He is a snake. He's a serpent in Genesis chapter one, right? And he's coming along trying to figure out who he can get those teeth into to stop them from fulfilling what God has for their life. And so he says, be on alert because the devil is after your life. But resist him. How do you resist him? 
How do you resist the enemy in your life? Because I know he's after all of you. I talked to some of you this morning. I know there's people in here today that are hurting. So how do you resist the enemy when he's coming after you? You stand firm in your faith and you know what you know. What do you know? God's got the power. And you know that other people are suffering as well and going through the same thing. It's happening to people all over the world. So you learn to resist him, one, by just praying the name of Jesus over your situation. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every demon has to flee. How cool is that? Right? At the name of Jesus, every